All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Burns, and I will be uh, the, ho the host for this panel. I am currently a graduate student at Drexel University in Philadelphia. I've had the great opportunity during my time in my global and international education program to have Dr. Kelly here as a professor for two different classes, and she has invited me to assist for this Gender and Corruption Accelerating Poverty Panel for the NGO CSW Forum. I will be monitoring the chat for any questions or comments viewers may have for our panelists, uh, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Kayla. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have so many people here. Um, and very um, importantly, as part of the NGO forum at the CSW 68. Um, today's panel is entitled Gender, oh, so I'm moving this around, Gender and Corruption, Accelerating Poverty, and it is co-hosted along with Drexel University by the UNCAC Coalition, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, the Anti-Corruption Resource Center at CMI, the United Nations University Merit, and as well with um, Uppsala University. Um, and we're really excited to have uh, many scholars and experts, newcomers to the field, all here to present a little bit about their research and to update you on the growing field of gender and corruption. We're hoping um, through this panel to bring more gender equality experts and practitioners to the work of anti-corruption, as well as connecting anti-corruption experts and practitioners to gender equality folks so that we can tackle both problems at the same time. So to give you a little sense of our panel today. Um, we have a number of speakers talking about really a, a quite a, a, a broad uh, sense of kind of the field. We'll have a short overview of gender and corruption, the field as it's growing, um, by Ortrin Merkel, who's here from United Nations University. Um, sexual corruption is our next topic, what it is and why it matters, by Aline uh, Bjarnegaard, who is um, a researcher at Uppsala University. We have uh, Michelle Coleman, who's here as well, uh, uh, a doctoral a PhD candidate from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She will be telling us a little bit about um, how sextortion is impacting health systems. And then we will go take a quick geographical detour to the West Balkans and get an update on what's happening in the West Balkans. Casey Ruka is here, a student at Drexel University, who's been doing some research around the policy frameworks and the environment there. We're going to close out today um, with a really important uh, look at the world of UNCAC and the, which is the the U uh, the um, the UN uh, anti corruption organization that is for civil society groups to come together and connect their work. So um, Matthew Gihoshi is here to present some of the work that's going on there and how we can all get involved. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist, Aline. Um, we will have a few minutes after each presenter to take a couple questions, but then we really want to save time at the end for conversation to hear about your experiences, as well as to find ways that we can better connect this work to the work of uh, gender professionals around the world. So I will stop sharing um, and we'll turn it over to Aline. Thank you. To Orton, I think, was yeah, first. Yeah, I think I was going yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize, Orton, no thank you so much. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, Kelly, and thanks for, for putting together, uh, can't see, no, I did, Christy, sorry, uh, for putting together an interesting um, um, panel. Um, so my name is Orchun, I'm a researcher at Union Merit, and I'm, my research is focused mostly on, well, gender and corruption overall, but particularly um, uh, to, my, in the context of migration, um, and um, there I'm focusing especially on sextortion and uh, the role of gender norms. So you know a little bit where I'm coming from. Um, also, in my overview, of course, my focus is impacted a little bit by that. Um, I want to start with a bit of a, a caveat, and that is when we talk about gender and corruption, we still talk mostly about men and women, right? So we still have a bit of a um, binary understanding of, of gender. Most of the research um, is still focusing on that. Um, we only slowly start seeing more um, research that also um, includes LGBTQI um, plus um, issues. So just that's just as a as a caveat, and I guess also as a 
um, as a research gap um, that needs to be filled. With that being said, um, gender and corruption has slowly risen higher on the agenda, um, and it's kind of reached, it's reaching a peak at the moment, um, both in research and in policy over the last 20 years. Um, it started with kind of very simple um, um, realization that there seems to be a relationship between having more women in um, parliaments and lower levels of corruption, right? And since then we've made a lot of fascinating progress, a lot of nuances in the relationship, but we also still have quite a few open questions that need to be answered and the, the, the other panelists will also highlight um, uh, some of them in, in with their research. Um, and one thing that I think is especially important uh, in, in in the context of this panel is that a lot of the research that we see is still focusing on the relationship between women and politics and corruption. And while that is, of course, uh, super important, it often neglects looking at kind of the most vulnerable um, and those that don't have uh, power um, and, and is really focusing still on, on the very powerful. So that's that's one thing, um, and especially when we're looking also at in the context of poverty, of course, that is very important. So when we look at the work that has been done until now in the context of, of gender and corruption, we can roughly divide it into kind of four um, subfields, right? And we will focus mostly on the last two, but I'll go through each of them um, very shortly. So one of the first ones is um, that, diff, you know, are there differences in attitudes towards and perceptions of corruption between men and women? And early on discussions kind of emerged um, about the question, if women are the fairer sex, you know, are they just better people and therefore reduce corruption simply by existing in the political space? And of course, it quickly turned out that no, that's not the case, right? Women who um, are in political power positions can be just as corrupt as men. Um, but we do see that there is a relationship that it seems that, you know, more gender equality also is linked to lower corruption levels. Why that is the case is still quite debated. There are lots of different um, pathways that um, that uh, have been highlighted, um, you know, depending on institutions, the overall nature of the political system, culture, all of them, um, lots of different um, elements. What is clear, though, is that involving women does uh, matter, but women are not per se um, better or less corrupt. So that's, I would say, one first important kind of thing to remember. Uh, this then leads to the second question that came up um, after, you know, the first studies revealed, oh, there is a role that women um, play, is what kind of role should women play in anti-corruption, right? And again, this idea that are they maybe the political cleaner forces, right, that will make everything better, was quickly discarded saying, no, it's not um, including any women um, will solve the problem. Rather, what has been you know, found out now. And what, if we think about it, is not surprising, but still the research took a while to get to it, is that it matters who, right? It matters what kind of women we involve. It matters that women are not part of the same corrupt networks, right? It's not enough to have kind of token women that are in the, the wives and sisters and brothers and uh, sisters and, and um, uh, daughters or friends of corrupt men that are in the same network. No, we need to make sure that women who are outside these networks are included, that um, that women um, from minority groups or from tr discriminated groups are also included. So it really matters of who is included. And then women can play a very important and should play a very important role in anti-corruption work. And um, one thing that I think also is always important to highlight here is, of course, that we also don't want to put the burden of being anti-corruption champions on women, right? <laughs> not It's not the sole responsibility of women. They're one actor in this thing. But um, they're not the ones who have to fix um, the fix the problem. Um, the next or uh, the sort of third um, kind of part that you will hear um, a lot more in, in the following presentations is that um, relatively recently, actually, <laughs> it came to the kind of um, realization that there are different forms of corruption that are gendered, right? And that not um, that until now we had kind of a very male centric view on corruption where the payment is the exchange of money, power and goods. Um, and that it ignored the form of corruption where a person's body is kind of the, the form of payment. And Alina Michelle will talk about this a lot more. So I'll leave it at that. But that's an important um, topic that came up only in the last um, few years is getting more attention also in kind of the policy world. And last, but definitely not least, kind of uh, the, the fourth um, subfield is the question about difference in the experiences of corruption. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, right? 
And what is always surprising me in this area is that you find a lot of um, agreement that yes, of course, men and women experience corruption different. It, it, um, but then very few um, case study and very few kind of in-depth research still focuses on this. Um, so that's something also to keep in mind that while we do know that the experiences are different, we still need to find out much more about why are they different and how are they different. And of course, especially when we're thinking about poverty and those who are most vulnerable, um, that is a really important question to ask. Um, of course, if we look at poverty, it's not um, it's not at all surprising that um, corruption has a gendered lens, and it's not at all surprising that corruption plays an important role, right? We know that corruption increases the levels of poverty simply by diverting money from government investments. And we do know that women make up a majority of the poor. So it's clear that women are especially impacted by uh, corruption there. Um, we also know that the poor, especially, and this, again, especially women, depend heavily on government services, which of course are not available or have inferior quality when corruption is rampant. So again, it's women who are most at risk of losing out. And again, it's the most vulnerable women who are at risk of losing out. And one thing that from my own research and that I think is getting more and more in attention, um, and especially when we're thinking about um, gender, I think is really, really important, is to understand the role of norms in corruption and particularly also the role of gender norms, right? And these norms dictate individuals' participation in the exposure to and the experiences of corruption, right? And here, um, what, what we find is that socialization plays a really important role um, as girls are brought up to behave more properly by being more and more, more compliant, be more risk or worse, um, while boys are often more rewarded for forceful behaviors. Um, and so the gender norms that are embedded really from early childhood shape attitudes participation in and experiences of corruption. Um, and so countering these deep root norms um, that um, are often considered um, for people who work on kind of gender issues is also really paramount for um, anti-corruption strategies. And I think that's a really interesting point where we can have lots of syner synergies um, of those of us working kind of on, in the anti-corruption space and those that work in, in the, the gender equality um, space. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes um, to to kind of um, talk a little bit about um, some of my research on a case study and how these things um, play out and why I think it's important to to talk about um, specifically um, norms. So as I said, we have um, I'm I'm doing research on migration, and when I ask you, you know, um, do you think that irregular those who travel irregularly, so without proper documentations, without visas, um, are exposed to corruption during their journey, um, most of you will say, yeah, obviously, right? <laughs> it's it's um, But yet there was little research that kind of dug deeper into this um, into this topic. And what we found very quickly is that, you know, corruption really shapes in the entire journey. So that's very clear, especially for women. You know, it starts from um, uh, uh, kind of the home country where, um, uh, people have to get documents. Again, for example, women um, in, in many places, um, their birth might not have been registered because um, it's expensive because of corruption. Um, so then if a woman wants to go anywhere and she needs proper documentation, that's the first place where she has to or um, bribe in some um, way, shape or form um, to get um, any form of, of ID, right? And it continues um, and can continues um, like this. And of course, the more restricted legal options are for migration, um, the more um, corruption comes into play, right? Because people need to um, want to leave for, for whatever reason, um, and they will make it happen. And um, so if you can't do it legally, you will find ways, um, you will find ways around it. And the risk is very clearly high in this during transit. That's also not, um, uh, not surprising. So once people leave their home country and kind of their no networks, you know, they're more and more reliant on um, corruption. Um, and we really see that it happens at each um, stage. Um, and here, again, without I wanting to take away anything from, from the next presentation, of course, extortion for women plays a huge role, um, where we found um, that women, including trans women, are especially vulnerable, um, but also um, men and boys typically um, often encounter this form of corruption um, when, for example, trying to cross borders. Um, this research also shows us how important it is to kind of look at these case studies in the context of understanding underlying norms. Um, and 
we did this with, um, so this is based on qualitative research, I should add that, um, where we did interviews with kind of um, people who, who work with migrants and migrants themselves. Um, and um, we found kind of a whole, whole number of ways in which um, norms really play a huge, um, a huge, a huge role, sorry. Um, I already said that, you know, um, for example, who gets um, registered, who doesn't, is, is a question of norms. Um, but also that, for example, still oftentimes money is collected for um, for young men to migrate, um, while oftentimes still young women migrate kind of in opposition to their families. So, of course, then they don't have the same financial means, so they have to rely on other things um, um, to to get through, right? Um, the the um, patriarchal structures have also been shown to kind of um, determine who is it considered an easy and viable target for corruption and violence. And this is interesting where it's not just women, but also, for example, um, men that don't fit um, kind of classical male norms. So men who are more effeminate, for example, um, are then also seen as kind of easy, um, easy targets. And this then um, is... Um, you know, linked to kind of questions around masculinity, right? Um, that also need to be explored um, uh, more in detail. Um, and just to to again give a couple of examples that we came across in our research is um, uh, that we found that um, while both men and women um, face violence for non-payment of corruption, for example, what the the violence that men faced was often described as more severe. Um, stigma and shame um, is often um, uh, even bigger for um, for men, um, especially when it comes to sextortion, um, and that there was a huge amount of violence against those that do not fit gendered expectations, right? Such and this includes trans women, effeminate or gay men, um, that you know not fitting certain types of expectations um, will make you um, more exposed to violence, including, um, of course, um, sexual violence. Um, so this is just kind of using one case study or one sectoral study to show why it is so important to look at, you know, not just gender and corruption as a whole, but like also questions around norms. Um, so maybe to, to just wrap up this kind of very short um, introduction to to the field um, is the question of you know where should we move forward to and I think there are a couple of questions that I'm hoping um, we can focus on um, in this gender and corruption um, space more. Um, one is this broader focus on gender, um, including um, uh, in LGBTQI um, issues, including questions um, around. Um, uh, norms and gender roles, stereotypes, all of these things. Um, and we need um, more kind of um, case studies. I'm very happy to hear um, that, you know, that we're hearing a couple of uh, case studies um, in this panel as well, um, that dig really into a sector, into a country uh, context um, and how um, uh, corruption is experienced. And here it's also this focus on um, you know, moving, not moving away because the focus on kind of women in politics is is important, um, but to kind of shift and um, also our focus on on um, particularly vulnerable groups and understanding that um, certain, you know, groups of women, for example, are particularly vulnerable to corruption and, and digging into that deeper um, also then for, for giving uh, policy advice. So this was just a very short run through um, and I'm looking forward to to the next sex, uh, the next um, discussions. Thank you so much. Um, we do have time for one question, or if you anyone has a question they'd like to put in the chat. Um, otherwise, we will turn it over to our next speaker, who is Aline Bjarnegard. Okay, I will try to share my screen. Read while we wait and see if there's a question. There, can you all see it? All right, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Christy, and thank you, Orton, also for that 
uh, in production, which I think uh, just really uh, sets the scene for for the other presentations as well, so that we kind of know where to where to enter this kind of complex discussion about about gender and corruption, because there are many different angles that that can be explored and that that need to be explored. Um, so my name is, is Elin Bjarnegård. Uh, I am a professor of political science at Uppsala University. And uh, I've spent uh, a large part of my, of my career studying and doing research on some of these aspects of, of gender and corruption that, that Orton also mentioned. So basically how, how gender is in some ways a driver, how, how corruption is gendered and who participates, who's given the opportunity uh, to, to, for a corrupt exchange, but also consequences and experiences of corruption. Um, and I have in particular been engaged in this question of seeing women as a potential you know, anti-corruption force and, and have really focused on trying to bring men and masculinities into the corruption equation. Uh, because if research shows that corruption is in many ways, you know, a, a male dominated problem, then it's also there. We need to look for, for some of the problems and solutions. So um, in this way, I, and I think this is also where the field has been for a long time. And it was a couple of years ago uh, that uh, a colleague who was uh, Aldean, who worked uh, at the time at CEDA, which is the Swedish uh, International Development Agency, um, came to me and, and wanted to, to talk about the gender aspect of corruption that uh, she had heard being encountered and then talked about uh, at her agency, namely, sexual forms of corruption uh, and so 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 for me this was really you know a meeting between academic research and practice i had myself been doing some consultancy work uh, for different organizations and when we sat down and talked about this i i also realized that this is really an aspect of corruption when when the bribe if you will is the the exchange the the currency that's used in the exchange is gendered in itself and when that's when, when to think about sex as something that has uh, a role in in corruption it hasn't really uh, or it hadn't really i i should say uh, been acknowledged and recognized at the time um but i think that the time was uh, in many ways ripe for that because since and in the past few years we have seen uh, really an increase in research, an increase in awareness and discussion about sexual forms of corruption uh, among organizations and uh, in, in policy work as well as, as in research. Uh, so it's long overdue but it's I think uh, finally there uh, and I thought that I would uh, use this space to to talk a bit about how we uh, in in the team that I work with here at Uppsala University, uh, how we work around understanding uh, this thing. W what is sexual corruption? Um, how is it different from, from other forms of corruption? How is it different from gender-based violence in different forms? And why does it potentially matter if we talk about something as as corruption, uh, what is what is the value uh, in that? Uh, so let's see if I can move this forward. So um, sexual corruption, what is it? I mean, it comes in in many forms. When when a border official uh, demands sex for someone to cross the border, it's sexual corruption. When uh, a boss gives someone a promotion only if they get a sexual service in exchange, that is corruption. When grades are based not on educational performance, but on the delivery of a sexual favor, that is also corruption. And we've seen uh, examples uh, of this, anecdotal evidence, stories being told, experiences being shared, uh, but increasingly also uh, survey uh, research is demonstrating that this is a phenomenon that is everywhere uh, on the globe 
and in all kinds of sectors. We don't know exactly how widespread the problem is, simply because we don't quite know exactly what it is as of yet. Different people uh, tend to include different things uh, into the definition of, of sexual corruption. We don't even agree on, on the word uh, that we should use for it. Uh, and we see different surveys and different studies uh, going out, uh, meaning different things. And this may seem to some extent as a kind of academic conceptual exercise, uh, but I really uh, think it matters for practice. I think it is very important that we uh, don't get ahead of ourselves and start collecting, you know, uh, evidence or even worse, start asking uh, victims of sexual corruption to report to authorities, especially if those authorities do not recognize this as a crime. Um, so uh, I will uh, put forward uh, how we view uh, this phenomenon now, how we, uh, at the moment, I should say, think it should be defined and move forward, because I will say that this is something that we in, in uh, the research team discuss continuously, and we have changed our minds <laughs> about this quite a few times, and we've already heard uh, the name um, sextortion being mentioned, and this is how we started out. We talked about sextortion initially. Uh, we have opted to call it sexual corruption instead, and I will uh, shortly let you know why, why that is. Um, so our definition uh, that we work with now is sexual corruption is something that occurs when a person abuses their entrusted authority. So a person who has some kind of authority, it can be a public official, it can be a teacher, it can be a border official, uh, it can be someone uh, who, who uh, is um, a manager, uh, for instance. When a person abuses their entrusted authority to obtain a sexual favor in exchange for a service or benefit that is connected to this person's entrusted authority. So these three aspects, uh, looking at, at sexual favors as something that is actually used in corrupt exchanges in some way similar to the way that bribes, uh, monetary bribes, for instance, would be used, but they're used uh, to get something that the person in authority has the power over by virtue of being in that particular position. Uh, this is, is the type of corruption that we are, are looking at. So this means that it's not necessarily the same thing as prostitution, for instance, which does not necessarily involve the abuse of entrusted authority. Uh, but it also means that it's not the same thing as other forms of sexual harassment because that does not involve the transaction. And this very fact that it has these two components of corruption as well as gender-based violence, but that it's also neither one of them, I think is the reason why this phenomenon tends to fall between two stools or to kind of like re really not fit the template of either. And this is, I think, exactly what my colleague came to me a few years back and said, the corruption department does not recognize this as corruption because it's it's about sex. It's about, you know, uh, sexual abuse and sexual harassment. And then the gender based violence department did not recognize it because they did not see this as gender based violence because they interpreted the agreement to the transaction as sexual consent. So it's not recognized uh, by either of these kind of uh, uh, fields because sex is generally or hasn't until recently been recognized as something that could potentially be a currency in corruption. And the fact that sometimes the use of force and coercion is not needed because it can be an agreement blurs the issue of what sexual consent is. 
So then the question is, we have these two, two possible ways of seeing it, corruption or gender-based violence. So why is it that we have opted to, to uh, suggest that we view this as corruption? And it's, I will first say it's not as simple as that, because bringing in sex as a currency in corruption does change some con conventional wisdom that we know about corruption. So it, it does change things. But there are some, I think, advantages and some important aspects of viewing this within a corruption framework. And the most important one, I think, is that seeing it as corruption enables a shift in focus to the abuse of power that sexual corruption entails. It is abuse of power when a teacher does not give out grades because someone has performed in a particular way on tests, but in exchange for sex. And it is abuse of power when a border official does not look to see if you have the correct papers, but lets you cross the border or not, depending on if you uh, give sex. And it is abuse of power if you get a promotion uh, not because you have the right qualifications, but because you offer sex. All of these are abuse of power, but they're often viewed as something else. They're often viewed as a way of, you know, sleeping your way to the top. They're, they can be viewed as ways of getting unfair advantages, or they can be viewed as sexual harassment, where we don't recognize the wrongdoing that it entails when you refuse to give someone uh, the services that you and your position uh, have the right over. And I think the fact that sex uh, is in this corruption equation, it's a condition to get services, either services that you have the right to or services uh, that are an unfair advantage. This also means that it's not consensual sex. It may not be coercion, it may not be force, it may even be offered by the victim of extortion, but it's nevertheless non-consensual sex and it is abuse of power. So uh, this has brought us to kind of trying to see what is then sexual corruption and what is not, and it comes in many forms. Um, so we, we look at these three components that I started with. So sex can be a currency, there is an exchange, a quid pro quo, a this for that involved, and there is a trusted authority that, that is abused. This means that uh, we can see uh, a person in entrusted authority to either request sex in exchange for fair treatment, so a person says that I will not give you what you have a right to unless uh, you give me sex. But it can also be uh, a request for sex in exchange for unfair advantages. Uh, so to give someone a promotion that they don't really have the qualifications for, for instance. But it can also be more subtle. In some cases, we have seen that sexual corruption is so institutionalized that you don't even need to explicitly request it. People know that in order to graduate from a certain university or to get a certain grade from a teacher or to you know, pass a border, you need to offer sex in exchange, either for fair treatment to get what you have the right to or to get advantages that you would like to get. And even if it is offered and even if it is unfair advantages, uh, this is abuse of power because this is not how we want people in positions of untrusted authorities to operate, of course. So um, when we return to the question of sextortion or sexual corruption, this is what we think is usually implied by sextortion. Sextortion builds on the word words sex and extortion. And extortion means coercion by threatening to withhold something that you have the right to do. So that involves a psychological form of, of coercion, if you will. We, however, uh, think that there's more, as you can see, to sexual corruption than sextortion or sexual extortion. We think that also this is sexual corruption. 
This is what sometimes we think brings in the risk of, of victim blaming when we do not see it as corruption. Then we can start seeing instead that people sleep their way to the top or get, you know, an easy, easy way out or get grades that they don't really um, perhaps have the right to. But nevertheless, there was a person in authority who gave them uh, unfair uh, advantages in exchange for sex. So all of this, we think, are cases of sexual corruption. And this is why we, after long discussions, have opted to say that, well, if we talk about sextortion, we think that should be you know, reserved for the, the upper uh, role here. But everything here needs to be included. So, so to conclude then, uh, I think that a sexual corruption framework is important also for all of us who are working with gender-based violence, with gender equality more broadly, when we can use it to enable a focus on the abuse of power, which needs to be, I think, front and center uh, in, in these cases. And in, in the advocacy world now, and in, uh, in policy and research alike, we do see, and I, I really welcome this, uh, it's, there's an increased advocacy and awareness raising uh, about sexual corruption and sextortion. And I think this is long overdue and very welcome. But I would like to caution against getting ahead of ourselves as well, because there is a quite strong focus on awareness raising also among victims and on asking them to step forward, to be brave, to report cases of sexual corruption. And what we have seen, uh, and what we're quite certain of uh, these days, is that there is no, there's no scholarly consensus on what constitutes sexual corruption. And there's even less you know, consensus in legal terms on what the legal framework is for cases of sexual corruption. There are a handful of cases that seem to have laws that could be used specifically against sexual corruption. There are some more cases in the world where either, you know, sexual harassment legislation or uh, corruption legislation could potentially be used, but we don't really know. So if we're asking uh, women, it's often women, but as Orton pointed out, not, not necessarily, but if we're asking victims of sexual corruption to step forward, into a vacuum where there's really not legal support for them. Uh, I think we may run the risk of doing them a, a disfavor and, and uh, we really need to, to, uh, yeah, to, to exert caution here and to make sure that we do this in a, in a victim-centered way uh, where they can step forward uh, and be protected at the same time. So, so, so we need to, to proceed. Of course, we need to proceed with you know, the holistic approach that also entails reporting and stepping forward and supporting. But we do need to be aware that we also need to continue the discussion about what this is and what type of, of legal frameworks that, that could be put in place uh, in order to really uh, end impunity and, and protect victims of, of sexual corruption. I will end there. Thank you. I can, by the way, if you want to read more, I can uh, share some of the sources that we have here. Hmm. Thank you so much, Aline. And if you have time or are able, if you want to um, put any of those links into the chat, I know that people will really appreciate, especially your latest piece that's just come out, a really exciting and clear read. Um, you have one question actually from the chat already um, from B Denise Bayer. Denise, do you want to open your mic and ask your question directly if you're able? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I am, in terms of the corruption debate, a lot of it is just only defining economic corruption. And I really appreciated the presentation. I think what I'm curious about is it worthwhile to start delineating differences and similarities between economic and political corruption um, and looking beyond and building on that distinction that was just made uh, between fair treatment, which seems to be more political power based and aligning norms with um, 
treatment and just economic benefit that's unfair. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think uh, we, we build on, on um, Rose Sackerman and others who have kind of uh, discussed corruption in the form of of you know either withholding uh, rights or giving advantages, and I I think it's it is important um, both because both for the for the corruption field because it poses new questions to the field of corruption. I think when we start discussing sex as a potential bribe, but I also think it is important for 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 the field who are interested in in understanding sexual forms of corruption and not because it's necessarily the most important aspect is to you know differentiate between different types of of sexual corruption and which is you know worse than the other i don't think that's the goal here it's more i think to delineate carefully uh what could be addressed within a corruption framework and what is better addressed somewhere else uh and to really uh make sure that we include um uh, cases that do constitute corruption uh but uh and whether they are you know uh forms of extortion or or bribery um uh, yeah so uh, i welcome uh, that that uh, discussion i'm not sure if i answered your question i will read it and see if i can address it more carefully thanks we have um actually another question from serena in the chat um Want to read there? Uh, where can we find fundamental solutions to these problems? Yeah, I mean uh, that's uh, that's really the the fundamental question, isn't it? I think, I mean, I I really think that there are many different solutions because it is a complex uh, problem, and at this point in time, I just think putting them on the table, addressing them, and talking about them is if nothing else, a good start. Uh, but I think as we do so, I think it is important that we don't kind of revisit the mistakes that we have, have done in many other fields and start discussing this as a you know women's problem or how can we solve it. This is a problem of abuse of authority, of sexual abuse of authority uh, that is fundamentally uh, gendered uh, and you know that the sense of entitlement and uh, misuse of power uh, is, is gendered, but it's to some extent gendered to the masculine, and that needs to be, I think, uh, yeah, at the forefront of, of this discussion. Uh, but but yeah, any I think uh, many of the participants in this room can also contribute with ideas about, about the, the solution, potential solutions to this problem. So I look forward to that. Thank you so much. And we'll keep the conversation going forward. Um, we're next going to invite Michelle Coleman um, to share her slides. And she'll be talking more about uh, how sexual corruption is showing up in health systems. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I am Michelle Coleman, as she just mentioned, a doctoral candidate at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today on such an important issue. And now we're gonna narrow the focus from sextortion broadly to health systems. So as we just heard, sextortion is a critical type of corruption affecting vulnerable groups around the world. It's a manifestation of gender-based violence, is inherently a human rights violation and a grave public health concern because of its effects on the physical, emotional, and mental well-being of the victim. Moreover, it impacts health systems' abilities to achieve universal health coverage and deliver services in the most effective, high-quality manner. And this is the direct link to the theme of this session. When a person is unable to access quality health services, they suffer more than just physically, but also economically. And because sextortion is often propagated against those with limited power, they are more often than not also in lower socioeconomic status and the act of sextortion can further disen disenfranchise them economically. So, because of this critical link, I'll be talking about the need to understand how and where sextortion is occurring within health systems. Despite the health consequences that we speculate and know exist, limited evidence um, exists on sextortion occurring within the health sector specifically. I'll share some of the current limited literature, 
um, focusing mainly on low to middle income countries with a concentration on its prevalence, drivers associated with it. And then I'll end the presentation with some of these recommendations we were just talking about. So we know that um, participants hop in and off. So some of this will be a repeat for those that have been here long-term, but as a reminder and a recap, sextortion is a gendered form of corruption and a form of sexual violence, exploitation, or abuse that occurs when those entrusted with power use it to transact a sexual favor as currency with those who depend on them to access vital services. This exploitation of power and trust typically takes the form of an unwanted demand for sexual activity subtly or overtly, using the authoritative role as a means to enforce compliance for that personal gain. So sextortion sets itself apart from other types of sexual violence and exploitation by incorporating this important transactional element. And uh, similar to Ortun as well, this act is a gendered and disproportionately affects women and girls, but it can also affect men, boys, and other gender and sexual identities. Um, sex sextortion can happen to any gender, including the LGBTQ+, transgender, gender non-conforming, but however, most of the literature that's available uh, focuses only on sextortion's impact on women. So, uh, as you can see here, sextortion tends to be studied sporadically in public surveys and is generally not sector-specific. As the health sector is consistently plagued by different forms of corruption, it is likely that sextortion also occurs in health system settings. It's difficult, though, to know how prevalent it is, what form it's taking, or where it's occurring within the health system, and then by whom. So here's some of what we do know. Estimates from Transparency International Global Corruption Barometer 2019 data show that in Latin America and the Middle East and North Africa, one in five people have experienced or know someone who has experienced sextortion while accessing health or education services. In a survey in the water sanitation and hygiene or WASH sector conducted in two subdistricts of Nairobi County, 67% of participants have heard of or knew of sextortion with the most common forms as offering or demanding of sex as payment for, for water. On overall, 22% of these respondents knew a person affected by sextortion. Then a 2019 study conducted by Transparent International Zimbabwe found that 57% of the women surveyed reported having to offer sexual favors to access medical care, have their children enrolled in school, or to receive a job. And then finally, a literature review focusing on corrupt practices in the recruitment and promotion of health workers found evidence of sexual harassment of workers that was implicitly linked to employment and promotion practices, particularly for female nurses. So you can see here that this collection of studies suggests sextortion is occurring throughout the world in various settings and sectors, but minimal is known about its occurrence specifically within health systems. So not only do we lack data on the prevalence, form, severity of it, there's also little information on the drivers of why it's occurring. We speculate that power and gender differentials can cause and widen these inequalities and inequities. Specifically, as previously mentioned, social cultural norms which shape the roles of men and women can result in men often occupying positions of power outside of the household, which in turn then can restrict women to domestic and childbearing roles and then limit their financial independence. So in turn, this can increase the likelihood of women and marginalized groups relying on public services and then resorting to alternate means to pay for them. So since sextortion typically involves that exchange of goods or services, this coupled with the elevated prevalence of women in marginalized groups accessing public services exacerbates the impact of corruption on these individuals. So preliminary, re preliminary research in Malawi found that while acts of sextortion are predominantly initiated by those in position of power, there are instances where the user of the service would initiate it because of an assumed expectation to pay this way or a lack of means to pay in another way. So as previously mentioned, this is that normalization of practice. And this has left some users, mainly women with no choice, but to initiate the service or initiate this practice as it is used and accepted in the system. Gender power dynamics then are also compounded by other stratifiers such as poverty, rural and urban living, education levels, disability, sexual orientation. All of this requires an intersectional lens to be applied when designing interventions. 
So for example, another study conducted in the WASH sector in Bangladesh studied factors that make women more vulnerable to sex extortion and found that women who live in poverty, water insecure households, or are illiterate face higher risk of sex extortion. So all of these here, all these factors lead to an increased risk of experiencing sex extortion. A deeper understanding then is needed of the social norms that deter survivors from reporting. Um, this contributes then to the stigma surrounding it. As we just heard, it's, it's a very cautious area that we need to proceed forward with. These norms are similar to those that make it difficult to report sexual assault or violence, such as shame and fear of disclosure or being ostracized even by your family or community. The reporting mechanisms may not even exist. And when they do, survivors may hesitate to report, fearing inadequate handling of their cases or minimal options for legal follow-up and support and possible reprisals. A 2019 UNODC survey in Nigeria found that men and women were reluctant to speak about sex extortion, and over 30% of the respondents said they just didn't feel comfortable telling anyone if they were asked to exchange a sexual favor for preferential treatment by a public official. So this reluctance to speak about sex extortion is also likely to translate to a reluctance to officially report it. This could be due in part to fear that as a victim, they could be subject to prosecution if the reporting of an event could lead to a perception that they were consenting participant in corruption, further building that stigma and fear and power differential that they may not be believed. This previously mentioned WASH study from Bangladesh revealed that about 40% of respondents who experienced extortion stated it adversely affects family honor or brings shame to the family. And then of the general survey respondents, 40% placed responsibility of the sex extortion event on the victim rather than the perpetrator. So both of these statistics underscore the stigma associated with sex extortion and cast blame on who have experienced it, which likely contribute to lower rates of disclosure and reporting. And as previously mentioned, within the legal communities, there also remains little consensus on how to define and subsequently prosecute extortion. This has led to this widespread lack of reporting mechanisms further contributing to avoiding reporting. The current reporting systems in place focus on financial bribes as the currency, disregarding sexual favors, um, and it's found that anti-corruption laws do not focus on sexual favors and that current sexual offense laws do not include the possibility of corruption, um, which means that may not be able to prosecute at all. International conventions or frameworks also do not always explicitly designate or reprimand sexual extortion, and this is likely due to anti-corruption efforts taking a gender-blind approach, which is gender is not specifically taken into account in anti-corruption strategies. It may incriminate both parties, including the victim, engaging in the corrupt act. So without le these legal frameworks, protections, recognition, and the prosecution, it will continue to remain hidden. An opportunity exists to capitalize on new momentum from the 10th Conference of the State Parties to the United Nations Conventions Against Corruption, which I think Matthew will be speaking about later. A resolution was passed in December 2023 on the societal impact of corruption. And this resolution specifically calls out demanding sex or acts of sexual nature as a particular form of corruption within the UN Convention Against Corruption. It encourages states parties to raise awareness and close these legislative gaps we keep speaking about. So on to the recommendations. What do we do with all of this information? We need to elevate the significance of engaging in discourse and establishing redress mechanisms on sex extortion. Without it, we cannot hope to meet universal health coverage. So I've listed eight recommendations here, but I'm not gonna walk through all of them. I'll just speak about four. So first, as previously mentioned, we simply don't have a lot of information about what's going on, and it's a tricky place to begin to collect that information. We don't know exactly how to study it, um, so we need to start there. We must gain this in-depth information about where, how, what types, and why sex extortion occurs, and to whom. We need more research on, in various settings to understand the prevalence, nuances, and the complexity of a human rights violation such as this. So the first step, we need to develop a strategy to capture and analyze sex disaggregated data to highlight the relationship between gender and corruption. And then this should also be complemented by context-specific qualitative data on social and gender norms, roles and dynamics, 
enabling a more nuanced understanding of how all this works together. And sextortion should also be captured more systematically in routine surveys that we already have going out. But again, we have to be very cautious on how we proceed and we should be aligned in this approach and our understanding of it. Recognizing the, and addressing sextortion requires collaborative action between a wider group of stakeholders as it sits at this unique nexus, that stool photo that Ellen had. It's in between the anti-corruption, women's empowerment, and then gender-based violence spheres. So not only does it impede progress on uh, achieving universal health coverage, it also affects our sustainable development goals. So number three and number five, both of these are achieving gender, gender equality, and in particular 5.2.1, which seeks to eliminate violence against women of girls, and then SCG 16, which seeks to reduce corruption in all of its forms. Collaborative cross-sector dialogues and developing strategies involving professionals from different spheres, the legal, health, justice, education, research, advocates, and those then affected on the ground can co-design strategies, policies, and actions to counter sextortion within health systems. We cannot understand this issue outside of the institutional and societal structures which reinforce these inequalities and powerlessness among certain groups. Organizations, especially those within the health sector, should develop policies and practices to become more gender responsive and inclusive, along with specific development and implementation of sextortion policies and implementation frameworks. Effectively addressing sextortion within the health sector requires a combination of these gender responsive strategies that deal with the consequences of gender inequality and gender transformation approaches. Initiatives involve reforms, engagement methodologies should challenge gender norms and power dynamics that we keep speaking about here. Moreover, changes to laws and policies promoting anti-corruption and ensuring equitable distribution of resources, services, along with, with the removal of structural barriers, a really big ask. We're talking about a health systems issue. They're wicked problems that require wicked solutions. So with all of that, I'll remind us that advancing these recommendations is paramount as they provide the foundation for global collective action against extortion, and then in turn safeguard universal health coverage and uphold human rights. I will stop there because that's getting quite winded. I would like to thank and acknowledge my fellow co-authors who contributed to these findings. Um, the contents of this presentation are forthcoming as a viewpoint in the Lancet. And then on the following slides are the references. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we actually have um, two questions for you in the chats. Um, first is, what are the statistics of sextortion within European or Western countries? The second is, how do you envision increasing accountability? Great questions. Um, so sextortion, so I specifically look at health systems and I can tell you, I have not seen sextortion statistics within European or Western countries. Um, that is definitely a blind spot in the research and an area that we hope to continue to study. And then increasing accountability. So, that's another great question. I would fall back on what we use in the general corruption space, um, that the active principles, accountability, transparency, um, anti-corruption, basically creating more mechanisms and policies and procedures to begin to uncover what is happening and then hold those in those positions of power accountable. There's whistleblower uh, mechanisms, there's codes of conduct, it can be training your uh, human resource department on how to approach this, how to speak about it, to take a social justice approach. Um, so there's a lot of different ways um, and within health systems, health system strengthening, this is um, falls back also on governance issues. And so there's a lot of frameworks that we can do. Um, but yeah, great question, I appreciate it. There's also um, the uh, person who asked the second question has um, some resources that they shared as well. For everybody, thank you. And Aline, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to fill in and, and Celia has shared in, in the chat. So when it comes to uh, sextortion uh, in Europe, there there is this transparency report uh that yeah that you could have a look at to to look at different numbers and we see that it is uh you know it exists everywhere uh to different extents but again then i 
uh, I just think we need to be reminded, and and I know that you know transparency uh, recognizes this as well. That it depends on how we ask the question. Uh, wh what does this actually measure? This measures a uh, percentage of people who experienced extortion or say they know someone who has. And then what do we mean by extortion? What is included? What is not? And then it's not just people who experience themselves, but but uh, also people who have heard heard about it to some extent. Uh, but but we do see it's it's uh, everywhere, but to to different degrees. But you can have a look uh, in that report to, to see the numbers. Thank you. I mean, there's so many great resources. Again, it seems to come back to we still need more research, right? And we need more work. So we're going to turn it over to Casey Ruka, who's going to take us down another case study, thinking more about what's going on in the Balkans and the kinds of um, shifts and changes taking place there to acknowledge and recognize gender and corruption. So Casey, I will turn it over to you. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Casey. I'm a senior undergraduate student at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And this presentation is largely centered around the topic um, of, of my senior project this year, which was um, addressing gender and corruption in the Western Balkans. And I took a policy approach. So I looked at the issue of gender and corruption through the regional lens and then analyze them separately, brought them together and then came up with um, based on like the literature and ongoing initiatives, some policy recommendations for how to move forward. So just to give a little bit of an introduction, um, why I chose the Western Balkans. Well, first of all, there's like a personal connection there. So um, I am originally from Albania, which is here. Um, I was born there. And my parents actually immigrated to the U.S. in 2001, a few years after the country's civil war, due to ongoing issues with corruption and instability and just the fear of what was to come for their future and for their children. And that's been a huge motivator in this project and why I'm interested in the Balkans. But aside from that lens, also the Balkans is an interesting region because a lot of the countries are prospective EU um, candidate countries and are attempting to address many of their ongoing corruption issues. And that stands as one of the greatest barriers as um, currently. And there's been a lot of ongoing democratic erosion, largely due to the weak foundations that the democracies were built in the 90s. And at the same time, there's also persistent gender equality issues. And it seems like there is not really a conversation connecting these two issues as much as there should be. And I was going to give go into the theoretical foundations, but I figured uh, the people before me would, um, and they did a really good job. So I guess the one thing I will mention is that um, currently a lot of the anti-corruption and gender solutions involve like, oh, just increase the number of women in so-and-so positions. And we clearly know at this point that that's not enough. And so I'm going to try to explore some other um, avenues for that. Oh, going backwards. Okay, so for the regional context, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of some of the main issues that are affecting the Balkans, um, the Western Balkans in particular. So all of the countries in the region, but except for Albania, were a part of Yugoslavia. And its dissolution in the 90s left a lot of um, lingering ethnic and religious turmoil, which is still present to this day. Um, the foundations upon which a lot of the democracies in the region were built were never quite strong. And they're seeing a lot of, in the midst of a global democratic recession, they're seeing a lot of authoritarian tendencies and a lot of human rights being rolled back. and. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of the economic crises that um, the countries have been facing in the region, um, which can be connected to the rapid transition to free market policies and neoliberalism in the 90s um, that and, and coupled with like the global um, recession in 2009 has left a very unstable situation 
where youth are leaving at historic rates. Um, I, there's one statistic that I thought was really interesting where the World Bank estimated 4.4 um, million people emigrated from the region between 1990 and 2015. And this accounts for like uh, to one third of the populations for um, Bosnia and Albania combined. So that is a huge number right there. <laughs> And to fill this gap that the economic crises have caused, many people have turned to organized crime, which started during the era of the, the um, Yugoslavia collapsing and has grown in prominence. Um, and in, in conjunction with corruption, organized crime continues to be one of the most severe issues facing the Balkans, as there is collusion between the government, political elite, uh, private businesses and gangs and organized crimes. It's created this whole, basically many sources of corrupt networks um, in the Western Balkans. And what's interesting is that this culture is rooted in misogyny as it's offered a lot of young men a way to assert their masculinity in a time where they don't have many other options to do so um, in the economy through formal jobs. And so this has led for a lot of women, a continuum of violence where the past trauma of war was never fully addressed and now they're facing a completely set of different gender issues than the war, but are still very much connected to the war. So to give a little bit of an overview of uh, gender um, inequality in the region, uh, one of the main issues is gender-based violence and like I just mentioned, a lot of this is leftover trauma from the war and how gender was really sidelined from state building and considered to be a part of development, but not a central part of development. And aside from uh, the patriarchal values, there is, like I mentioned, the toxic masculinity that has been linked to the organized crime. Um, there's a lot of domestic violence. Uh, Two thirds of women experience this in Albania. And in countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina, women are dealing with the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder of their partners who are struggling to find jobs. They have a lot of leftover weapons from the war. And so women have been playing that role of uh, being essentially burdened by both their trauma, but also the trauma of their husbands and their families. And there's also a lack of safe reporting mechanisms. So one common uh, thread I saw through like many studies was this distrust in public institutions, um, fear of retaliation from either their husbands or their partners or the men in their lives, or you know just in general like um, disillusionment with the results that may come out of reporting. And so cases like sex extortion, at least um, in a, in from what I saw, was like very underreported. Uh, in terms of bar barriers to employment, women are employed in the uh, formal economy at a much lower rate than men. And though there's like a lot of anecdotal evidence for this, I like I think it's interesting that this may be because they're unable to tap into. This, the corrupt networks that men are able to in order to get these higher paying jobs, even though they are like women are tend to be educated at the same or similar rates as men in the Western Balkans. And then in terms of corruption in politics, this is an interesting area. I didn't really want to focus too much on it, but I thought it was worth mentioning that the Balkans does have a 30% um, gender um, quota. So 30% of like, government has to be um, women, which not many political parties have been following. But what is more interesting is how parties are working to divert funding away from women candidates because of the lack of social capital that they have. And so that might be a more interesting way to look at uh, how to increase women representation in politics as opposed to just implementing quotas. And so here I created like a little mind map. Um, I like doing this kind of stuff because it helps me kind of pull everything together. But I just wanted to bridge the gap a little bit here and say how and talk about how 
gender and corruption, they're not sufficiently linked. And as you can see here, like usually they're treated as separate kind of areas. Um, and what we need right now is to have these anti-corruption initiatives boost gender equality initiatives because that will do the same vice versa. I found a few quotes that I thought were interesting about um, from studies in the region um, about how gender and corruption intersect. And this one from Bosnia, I thought was really interesting, where one woman was saying how it is an open secret that securing a job in public administration requires access to personal networks and the distribution of bribes to which women are shut out of. Another quote about sextortion talks about how it goes under the ro radar from social stigma, cultural taboos, and retaliation. And then a final quote, which I thought was the most interesting, this woman um, from Bosnia was saying um, about her husband, if I divorced him, I would have nothing. My husband would take it all away from me. He would bribe the court. And then where would I go and what would I live off of? So I think that quote does a really good job of summarizing how a lot of these issues with gender-based violence comes to intersect with corruption and this inability to have a proper um, safe reporting mechanism for escaping that situation and properly um, making a change in their lives. And so this kind of goes into my policy recommendations. I'm not going to read all of them out loud, but I thought I would just give a quick little overview. I categorize them into different areas. Um, so I have a few about strengthening the judiciary, which would include establishing specialized court units for gender sensitive cases. Um, I also found something in the literature that I thought was interesting of classifying sex extortion as a corruption crime, which is, I feel like somewhat mentioned earlier in a way to better prosecute these cases and have a better chance of success in like in bringing justice to the victims um, of those crimes. Also explaining wh expanding whistleblowing laws is very important through, um, there are various methods that you can do this. And I've seen a lot of research that transparency has done and um, in establishing anonymous hotlines or ways that people can report corruption without having to reveal their identities um, or in having preventing it from coming back to them um, and developing laws that protect whistleblowers as opposed to um, the other way around. And then pushing for gender mainstreaming. So again, this was mentioned earlier, but gender disaggregated data is very important, but also analysis of this data, not just collecting it, but making sense of it. Um, encouraging more partnerships between grassroots women's organizations that are doing the work of gender um, and connecting those to anti-corruption bodies to bridge that gap. And I also have a few recommendations on politics. So implementing gender sensitive auditing uh, for party financing and actually enforcing the consequences for political parties that do not comply with quotas or the budgeting or the auditing and having some teeth to those uh, laws. And of course, education is a critical component to all of this. So continuously, people need to receive educational programs, trainings, conversations about the link between gender and corruption um, in all forms. So that is <laughs> a little bit, I don't know what my time was on that, but um, that's just a little bit of an overview of what I have been working on. And I'm happy to take any questions, suggestions. I'm an undergrad, so if you have any recommendations, I will take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casey. It's really great to see what we can do in terms of scholarship and connecting the dots between these spaces. Um, and so congratulations and good luck in graduating and <laughs> your future. I, I hope you'll help us build the field. Um, we are now going to turn it over to our uh, final speaker, but in fact, one of the most important, I'm going to use my bias here to say Matthew is going to be presenting on exactly these kinds of opportunities we have to connect the dots and bring our research together and move the agenda forward in the global um, sphere. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks so much, Christy, and thank you to the previous presenters who made my life 
much easier now. I, there's a lot of things I'll just skip over. <laughs> no, I will not skip over. I will take my time. I will explain them. Um, and thank you to the participants for being here. My journey into this work with UNCAC was 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 a slow one, but it was a gradual one. I started my um, my research career really interested in questions of identity and their world in politics, particularly how are identities created, how are they understood in the social context, and then how do they become politically relevant. So I, as part of my um, work here at CMI, along with Monica Career, she asked me to join her in uh, doing some work on political participation and women's representation in politics and how that can be a form of corruption, how to increase accountability more in, in office. And we kept on saying, we wish we had a community of practice where we had scholars, researchers, activists, uh, practitioners come together and just discuss questions regarding gender and politics, gender and um, corruption and all these things. And luckily, um, a colleague at the UNODC put us together with UNCAC and together the Gender and Corruption Working Group came together and over the past year, it has done things that I don't think we could have imagined uh, achieving, in particular, as we will discuss later on, it's um, Resolution 1010, which is on gender and corruption and se taking sex extortion slash sexual corruption seriously. Um, but before that, just as a quick, um, I'm not going to say introduction, but sort of a, as a way of wrapping up everything that we've heard today. Um, Corruption undermines development, right? Stability and just global justice. Um, it affects who gets access to what, right? However, it because uh, not however because it affects who has access to what it it interacts differently with people's gender identities, right? And often the focus has been on men, women, but SOGI groups, the sexual or, or sexual orientation and gender identity groups, are often marginalized and very little understood in this context, right? So it is, it is imperative for us to actually include the understanding of gender in our work on corruption in order to understand which disparities exist and how we can actually attack them or address them. Yet, as all the previous ex uh, experts in this panel have, have, have shown, their gaps do exist. And coming together as practitioners and as scholars, right, either in, in whatever field we're in, getting out of those silos and actually having conversations across groups is gonna be really beneficial in identifying not just the gaps, but how we can address them. As Ellen's ethic example was really apt, right? Where she had someone from CEDA come to her and say, this is the phenomenon I'm hearing. And Ellen's a scholar, she's thinking, oh, these are the gaps I can identify, this is how I can study it. And actually having this well, meeting of minds is what leads to great innovation and actually impact. Um, quick question, is the, are the slides showing up as they should? I think. Yes, okay, good. Um, so what do we do at the UNCAC um, Working Group on Gender Inclusion and Corruption? Um, we gather and advocate for better data. So we have three uh, task forces that exist. There's one on sextortion. There's one on uh, data, which Michelle is in charge of. I think sextortion is Ellen who's in charge of actually. And there's one on uh, mainstreaming of, uh, <clears throat> of gender and corruption, of gender and anti-corruption policies. Uh, so we advocate for reforms in international law, policies and practices. And as I mentioned earlier, we try and make it a community of practice where people just come and speak to each other. We have presentations that go on. So that way we actually increase each other's capacities and knowledge on the issues and what we can actually do. And beyond the, the working group, it's how do we get actual impact in policy? Right, and sometimes that means collaborating with the UNODC, going to the, the Conference of State Parties, COSP, or even our own legislative bodies when we find out that they are going to be representing um, our countries, our respective countries in the COSP, right? Advocating at the local level and finding out months before the COSP is on what's going on and how can you advocate for it. <clears throat> so, uh, as, as I mentioned, there are three task forces and each of these have their um, own um, mandate, right? So the the mainstreaming gender equality and unc unc implementation. So what does that actually mean, right? So discussing resolutions, uh, implementation processes and outputs of the UNCAC, um, getting the wider anti-corruption com uh, community involved, right? Um, we have toolkits that are actually, we've created in, in advance of the cost so people can use them when they're doing the advocacy work. 
uh, legislative frameworks on sexual corruption and sex extortion. So this one, I think, is very much tied to this issue of um, data as well, right? So currently, there's a move to figure out what legislation exists around the world, um, what type of... Um, <clears throat> Uh, can we come up with a draft legislation for people to actually create, to use when they're uh, advocating for the legislators to implement or create or debate um, legislation that goes towards addressing sex extortion? Uh, what does it mean to have female friendly bureaucracies, right? uh, a uh, creating appropriate mechanism and remedies when people uh, report? Right? These are the things that we're trying to think about with all these different task forces. And then as data uh, comes into place, we have all these surveys that have been mentioned today, TI, the, the, the Global Corruption Barometer. But are there ways beyond asking men, women, that we can get to what gender norms exist in countries, right? Because it's contextual if we understand um, gender to be a social construct, right? Then what sort of uh, questions can we ask that tap into the no local norms that can let us know this is how gender and corruption are actually tied together and then we can actually do a better job of advocating and addressing it. Oh God, I went so far, um, pardon me. If you were, if you're a fast reader, you saw the presentation, you could log off and you're done. No I'm kidding, don't. Um, so our contribution. So the, um, the main thing that we did in our first year we, is that we had contribution to the COSP, right? And, uh, the uh, Conference of State Parties, which was in Atlanta in December. And we did two things. We had a resolution which was tabled by a friendly party and was have advocates from uh, Europe and North America who were also delegates and champions of it. But we also had a submission that was created by and presented, created by and presented by members of the working group to the COSP, right? And in the submission aspect, it was a really collaborative effort, right? So you had a working document that was posted online for working group members and you had everyone contribute to it, right? How can we make this sharper? What are the issues that we're missing? Are there ways we can address this better that um, the delegates, when we present this to the delegates who are going to be going to Atlanta, that we can actually be more persuasive. And then that's why we also had the toolkit that people had that would, people could use in their own social media, uh, social media campaigns that we're having. Um, but then the resolution itself was more of a closed door behind the scenes event. Um, so I'll just give you the highlights here of it, right? Um, for those in the know, the name changed, um, as uh, Michelle mentioned, right? Addressing the societal impacts of corruption, it was a far more um, ambitious title going in, um, but politics takes happens, right? And so we ended up with a more, it, it says something, but unfortunately this title, if you didn't know what you were addressing, you were trying to address gender and gendered inequalities, you could miss it completely from the title, the way it goes, right? Because it's just the societal impacts. Uh, but if you were to sit down, and I'm hoping, you know, a lot of you who are in the audience will take the time to go sit down and find the resolution and read it, you'll see that it actually has very gendered and very important contributions to this discussion of gender and, and corruption. So first, it recognizes sexual corruption as a particular form of corruption, which is huge, right? We've been talking about that, um, as I'll show later, gender and all the word women has only appeared six in six out of the 69 previous resolutions that exist, right? So that's less than 10%. But here we've gone from having such a small um, presence of these words in these resolutions to actually having one that addresses sexual corruption. It encourages the mainstreaming of uh, gender inequality and anti-corruption frameworks, and it actually uh, calls for the importance of main, uh, data in mainstreaming efforts, right? So not just mainstreaming for mainstreaming efforts, right? But actually thinking about, can we use data to make uh, uh, our, um, our efforts more effective? <clears throat> but it does fall short, right? So, I mean, it's not perfect entirely. So the human rights-based approach is sort of lacking. So what do we mean by this? It fails to recognize that corruption is a vehicle for discrimination, that it affects people with disabilities, children, young people, refugees, internally displaced uh, uh, persons as or transplantation in the beginning of the set, um, and that this corruption worsens inequalities and widens social exclusion, right? So this is one of the things that it, it, it fails on. 
um, it only speaks about men, women, boys, and girls. There's no mention of other gender identities, right? We tried to put gender inclusive language in there, saying that it is important for this inclusive language being to be um, part of the resolution, um, because diversity within groups is important to, to uh, acknowledge the subgroups that exist. But this was amended in, in policy, policy discussions and negotiations, so it was watered down to men, women, boys, and girls. Right? Um, and I think what's interesting here is to think that, is to remember that states are different places in their legislating gender equality, right? And the COSP is a place where resolutions are passed by consensus, right? So it's sort of this race to the bottom so that we can just get the least common denominator in order to get it passed. But we should not lose hope, right? Um, because what, I should you stop using the, because we have, we have momentum. Right. So three other resolutions, uh, 10, 3, 10, and 10, 12, do mention uh, gender inequality and corruption. Right? And as mentioned, um, having that there are four of them in one cost, right, that mention gender, and inequality, gender inequality and corruption is huge. Right? So what do the other three resolutions talk about? So I will just use... Okay, so that's 10, 3, uh, which is calling, it's a follow-up on Mar Marrakesh Declaration, and it basically asks that the um, Intergovernment Working Group uh, focus on how women and youth are affected by corruption and how they can contribute to fighting it. Right. Uh, 10.9, which is on promoting transparency. What this one does is you know, to look into how fair competition, um, especially the awarding of public contracts, affects women and women-owned businesses. Um, What's interesting here is this use of word, persons in vulnerable situations, right? Um, and I'll come back to this in a second. <clears throat> um, and the last one um, is on providing incentives for the private sector, right? So this one's about meaningful participation and leadership of women and girls in anti-corruption activities. Right? So uh, what is this one? So it, the, the four resolutions that were passed here, yeah, they've opened a door. Right. They've, they've let us put our foot in that we can actually advocate for more gender inclusive language um, in future resolutions that are going to happen. Right. So, um, and then through the working group and through the work that we do, we can actually have chances to collaborate with uh, the UNODC, especially because we have really friendly, uh, a friendly ear in the UNODC that wants to happen uh, to see gender and corruption advanced. We have countries like Canada, um, Sweden, the Nordics, who are really concerned with ensuring gender equality. And then gender equality in these resolutions is achieved. And so forming these coalitions for advocacy is going to be really, really important. So what can people do? I will see if I can actually put this in the chat right now as I say this. Um, and that is to um, sign up for the working group. I'll put the link to the uh, UNCAC Coalition Working Group page in the chat so you can actually sign up. Uh, when you sign up, you will have the ability to either join just on the task forces that you wish to join, or you could join all the task forces. We meet once every two months. It's an hour and a half meeting, but each task force has its own scheduled meetings, but we're thinking of changing that to make them all inclusive in one meeting. Uh, we'll have workshops and webinars, which are separate. So if you know an event that's going on on your campus, at your organization that you'd like to uh, advertise and be part of, uh, have a support network, post it. We, we have a huge mailing list and it's, it's a great way to get the support and the the eyes on um, the events that you really care about. Uh, the opportunities to uh, publish together. So um, we have blogs, we have policy briefs that we can uh, uh, post either on the UNCAC's uh, working page, or working group page, or at the U4, the Anti-Corruption Resource Center that we house here at, CS, uh, at CMI, and also work on the next submission in 2025, right? So we're already thinking ahead, like what can we do? What are the things that we need to do? How can we get these states and unfortunately very uh, masculine spaces to actually take gender seriously and put in the next resolution? Because unfortunately, even in these uh, uh, highly diplomatic arenas is still very gendered in a masculine um, way. So getting people to understand that gender is not just about men and women, but all of us and all our identities and how we show up in the world. So thank you very much for listening. I am happy to take questions and I'll stop sharing and put the link in the chat.
Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, that was a great way kind of ending our amazing panel today. And I'm not going to say ending, but really kicking off the future work that comes out of this and as we move forward. So um, at this point, we have a little bit of time for some overarching questions, um, comments, uh, shared resources. And I also invite the panelists to themselves ask questions of each other or find new ways of linking our work. I have a question for Matthew. I'm not sure if you did address this, but I, I noticed from multiple speakers, uh, we all called for this focus on gender identities or um, research on LGBTIQ+. Plus. Is there anything specifically within UN UNCOC moving forward that will be, other than these um, working groups that we have, is there is there a focus or an opportunity to push that work forward? Um, I think so. I think through the working group, uh, on, but also the human rights one, I think is on the going to be. It's going to be the one that we can, if we can get those two together, uh, our on, on gender corruption and inclusion and the one on human rights that just started recently. If those two can come together, I think it gives an opportunity to address the um, gender diverse uh, represent, um, groups in this work. Matthew, could you also include the link to the human rights one in case people wanted to connect themselves across both of those? I don't know if they're accepting members at this point, but that might be a good recommendation. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna take the prerogative to kind of ask a couple of questions of panelists. Um, I, I, and I think this goes to perhaps Michelle first, but I'll open it to others. What's next on the horizon for your research? Like what is the next thing that you'll be addressing knowing your expertise and things that we can be looking forward to on the horizon? Um, so great question. Um, specifically I'll be focusing actually in Vietnam, um, how I met you and I'll be looking at health service delivery um, corruption, specifically the, the gender differences um, within a longitudinal data set over 10 years, um, and then examining what the differences are, and then qualitatively how and why that's manifesting within the system. Um, so taking a little pivot from sextortion, but focusing still within health systems. Thanks. I would actually like to ask that question over to Ellen. Um, specifically, I would like to know what is moving in sexual corruption, because I we use sextortion, and I know there's disagreement amongst um, in the field amongst that, but where would where are you focusing your research next? Thanks. Yeah, we have um uh, we have many different uh ideas. The one that's perhaps closest now is that we hope to to do some uh work on the implementation of, of policy against sexual corruption uh, in, uh, in education in, in Tanzania. So Tanzania actually is one of the few countries that has a uh, law uh, specifically against uh, sexual corruption and where at least some educational institutions has also, have also uh, their own policies uh, against sexual corruption. So we will uh, try to See what happens and bringing in, you know, the the gender norms and the expectations and all of these things that Orton and others have talked about to to see what happens when you have quite clear policy. Uh, what are still, you know, challenges but also opportunities to actually uh, make that work and where are where are the gaps and and expectation? And then we're hoping to um, we're hoping to to move forward with measuring. Uh, sexual corruption in collaboration with uh, people who, who do this already, but to really move forward with getting more, uh, more exact uh, measurements um, so that we can say something more about, about the prevalence and, and to do more case studies as well uh, and try to do some systematic comparison of contexts and sectors 
And I think that's very important to try to understand how how both, you know, societal understandings, cultural norms, gender norms, but also how this manifests in different different sectors where where needs and services are are different. So yeah, lots to do. And Ortrun, I, I will turn the same question over to you. What's on the horizon for you and your team? Um, we're currently, um, we, we collected some data in Mexico on sex extortion and wash services. So we're, we're analyzing that. And what's the most interesting there for me is that our survey found basically no cases of sex extortion, but then our qualitative data found, um, lots of them in one area of Mexico city, but not in the other. So we're trying to find out kind of what makes the difference, um, one of the things is um, that it's a tight knit community, so it's it's also about kind of ex exploring more. Why does it occur some places and not others? Um, and also, um, yeah, in general, trying to um, collect more data on on gender and corruption issues, particularly sex extortion, but also um, migration issues, um, uh, as just collecting evidence. Basically, that's that's the main goal at the moment. Another question that I think Casey and I have pondered for a few years now is where can one learn about this? If we're gender practitioners or anti-corruption practitioners in the field and we don't have access to these amazing university level libraries and resources, well, where can one go to learn more about this? Are there trainings? Are there capacity buildings? What are you all recommending or seeing as impactful in the field? I mean, I, I can start. I think I think Transparency uh, International uh, has a lot of really good sources, reports and, and statistics that are also presented in a kind of accessible way uh, with charts and, and maps and, and things like that. So so it, it is possible to to see that. And there's a yeah several reports where they also talk about the, the different ways in which this can be done. Um, I mean, increasingly research is, is published open access, but I do recognize the fact that it may still, e even though it's accessible, it may still not be uh, a light read. Uh, so, so, uh, but I think also the 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 UNCAC coalition, the website there, uh, is is a really good good source of information. I just linked um, you for oh Matthew, you go ahead since you're no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so uh, you for we usually have online free online courses on gender and corruption um we are still in this in debate in discussions of whether we'll have them this year or completely revamp this the course and offer it early next year um if uh since i could actually what i will do since kelly is on the mailing list christy sorry not kelly uh is on the mailing list i will make sure that you get uh announcement for when the course is actually open and then you can just very widely for the CSW and Drexel for people who are interested. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Other questions, comments, thoughts as we're kind of wrapping up this session? I had a question I think for the panelists. Um, so which is in, and I think it's the it's Ellen's um, Ellen's um, disc, uh, presentation that provoked it. There's this question of um, power, right? And we've discussed gender, but there's this sort of this: is there a feminist critique of power and how it's understood contextually that can help us understand why people either? I mean, when Orchard says, right, in one region, one part of uh, of the of the country, they understand it as experiencing it and others are not, right? Uh, when it's in quantitative stuff, people are just not recognizing as such, but when you speak to them qualitatively, people start understanding it as extortion. So is there 
beyond gender? What is it about power and other feminist understandings either from the global south that can sort of help us understand these differences in recogn recognition at least? I mean, I, I don't have I don't have a, a good re response, I think, but I do think that's what's uh, you know driving many of us also to understand that more more precisely. What what is it here that we? I mean, and I th I think it's very interesting, Orter, that you also see this discrepancy between quantitative data and and qualitative data and uh, you know different geographical regions. I think that tells us something about that. This is. Yes, it is about power, and power is sometimes invisible. Some power is invisible to those who have it to some extent. Uh, and when something is institutionalized, it it means that it's not recognized necessarily as as an abuse of of that power. It's expected. It's what people, you know, uh, they may not they may not agree with it, but it's nevertheless what people know they have to do. And then you have to ask very you know, specific question to unearth that those power relations and those hierarchies uh, that are there. And and I think that that has happened to some extent in different contexts. And then when you ask a quite simple survey question in certain contexts, people will recognize it. Oh, yes, this is, you know, what I experienced in others. Uh, we will have to start working with with that awareness raising before before that data can be reliable. Uh, so yeah, it is complex, but I, I really do think that it's you know uh, power and institutionalization are are really important here to understand this and to be able to measure it. Yeah, I think that's really one of the key questions that we should all be kind of centering in our work. And I know from my own research looking longitudinally in Vietnam since the end of the American war there to today, there's different shifting perceptions of what is corruption versus what are longstanding ties of um, family connections or village connections. And I, I mean, I we're definitely seeing there, and I think this goes to Casey's work as well, that uh, economic, growing economic inequality creates strong patriarchal, you know, collusion with capitalism, with colonialism, with, um, you know, power in a way that sets up some people wanting to control and organize. And this, these kind of networks do turn into corruption when that seems to be the best way of getting access to what you want. Or if you've been denied access or opportunities to participate in in um, you know the growing economy, then again that ends up being it's it gets set up as the only way to overcome the barriers are to bribe, are to pay envelopes in advance, are to you know trade resources, networks, and connections. So I think that um, these cases, right, longitudinal, grounded in local context, but also this migration work that you're doing as well is fabulous because you see that people don't come out of context where this is normal, but they move into them and participate in them because that's how you get through it. And you move into a context where it's not normalized. And so you're not, so it's, we have to move beyond this idea that there are corrupt people, right? Which is again, why the feminist framework and the norms, I think, and the shifts and changes over time is so important to this research. I didn't mean to have the last word, so I invite anyone else to jump in there. It's a great last word, though. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I think we'll we'll close it off there. We have a lot to think about and clearly a lot of work to do. Um, but I want to really thank all the panelists during this very busy time of the year for everyone for coming together, sharing your expertise, um, raising the bar on anything that we can do to push forward an anti-corruption framework within the CSW space, as we are also bringing gender equality frameworks into the um, anti-corruption COSP space. So we're going to continue to connect the dots and look forward to all of you participating as we move forward. Thank you again for joining us today.
Thank you. Thank you so much.